Just as Frank Turner. Hey, this is Brian Down. Hello, Adam Green. Hi. Thanks for having me on the show. Hello, Steve Hello. Hi. Welcome back, guys. Thank you for having us. Yes, Common Towns, live at Glastonbury. Yeah, big up. And you heard the Common Talk podcast. And you're listening to the Common Talks podcast. Welcome to episode 18, I think, of the Common Talks podcast. This time again with Beans on Toast. Hi, Hello. Boys. Hi. Welcome, Jay. We're, we're, we're sort of hiding in the corner of a Turkish restaurant in Sweet. Berlin uh, just to set the scene for today's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last time we met here in Berlin, it was Halloween night. You played a gig at Grüner Salon and we spent the rest of the night at a crazy Halloween party at the White Trash. That's more than two years ago now. What happened in between? Um, that's a hell of a first question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. fine. Um, so, I would have got, if it was October, I would have got back um, after the German shows, I released the record in the UK and uh, toured that. And then, my years are all identical, basically. I, Generally, I'll go to the States for February, March, mm -hmm. and then I'll do a UK tour, a sort of not in the major cities, around the little bits and bobs, in like May, and then I'll do festivals, and then I'll record another album, and then I'll put it out, and, and now Christmas I come again. to Germany in the bit in between. And here we are again. And here we are again, yeah. <laughs> okay, and your tour in Germany started a few days ago, like Saturday, wasn't mm -hmm. it? How is it going so far? I'm having the best time ever, yeah. I, I almost, the only thing that I don't like is I wish I did it sooner. And it, longer. And, and well, we'll see, we'll see about that at the end. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, te, it's ten, sh ten shows in ten days. But, uh, yeah, I, I've, everybody's so nice. I've really met some, I've been welcomed into people's houses. And uh, it's, yeah, super, super nice. Thanks, Sean. Um, uh, my German's terrible. Uh, but I've been learning some key words like yes, Leuft, tell us one. Leuft, Leuft. <laughs> and uh, and Surligan, which I learned in Surligan because I was concerned about being an Englishman and you know the referendum. Uh, it's been quite interesting to be here four days after England stupidly leaves leaves the EU. But I which isn't your Germany. fault, of course. It, no, but you, you do wonder you do wonder you. how it's going to be it's going to be received. So I learned how to say sorry quite early on all right is it different now than it was the last tour in germany no okay no i've i've met like i said i've everyone's been i've not met anybody but super nice people that when, when i not many i i thought people would really want to talk about it i find that it only really comes up in conversation if i bring it up mm -hmm. um apart from with The only person I really spoke to in detail about it was uh, uh, someone's dad. It was like an, an, an older guy, and uh, he said that I would always be welcome in Germany, and that, and that was that was early on. So that uh, that made me feel pretty good about the whole thing. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that you were the yeah you were the first guest in our podcast. Uh huh. Since then, we had uh, apart from Billy Break, uh, we had. Will Varley, we had Frank Turner, we had Skinny Lister. There seems to be something something special about the Extra Meyer family. Yeah, that's What the gang, is it? isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I don't know, you can't really put, you know, you can't really put that into words, really, it's like without sort of getting super cheesy. It's, you know, I think Frank, you know, He's, he's your man really isn't he you know I think a lot of certainly the acts that, 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 that you sort of you mentioned there you know Frank likes it you do the tour you're on the label and but it's just I don't know Extra Mile is there's definitely a community there and uh, it's I guess it's bands that sort of work hard and uh, and and it's quite DIY as well it's like you know it's not like they give you money to make records And you know, and it's just—it's like people that are into music for the long term, rather than some kind of fashion or pan record. I don't know. You hear you hear such bad stories about record labels and how people got screwed by the record yep. labels and all this shit. I, you know, 
I've never had to deal with any of that because I've always worked on a handshake deal that I made nearly 10 years ago with, you know, with Extra Mile and it's been simple ever since. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Last time we spoke, you were a little worried about if the non-English speaking folks will get your lyrics. What are your experiences now after touring two more years? I, 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 it's it, it, That worry is still there. I think it's not warranted because people definitely do understand and, uh, and, and people can enjoy the music. But I just, I feel ignorant, basically. I just feel like I should be able to communicate better. And I feel a bit rude, like less, less so on stage than like here in a restaurant and whatnot. It's amazing that everybody can speak my language. But I just like, yeah, it's, and I miss as also traveling around. I really miss talking to taxi drivers. Okay. When I tour, they're like, <laughs> I'm like, I, I, not judge a city, but when I get to a new city, the first person I generally meet is a taxi driver, and I've, I have a, a strange relationship with taxi drivers all over the world, and I can't really, I, I miss that bond. I sort of sit there going, trying to. Who was your favourite one so far? My favourite taxi, taxi driver uh, was, D, was he was called the Big D, all and right. he was in Detroit, and uh, he was incredible. He's he, he was like a big dude. His car was all busted up, and. Uh, He couldn't believe that we were staying in the motel that we were staying at, and that we was. I was with Bobby, so there was two English guys playing because we was playing quite. We was, we was uh, supporting Floggy Molly, so we was playing like a big venue in Detroit, and he just couldn't get his head around it. And he was like, he actually gave us his number, and he was like, anything you want, you want drugs, you want women, I got this, I got this town on lockdown. And to be honest, I did ring him late at night, and he didn't answer his phone, so he did let me down a little bit, but uh, yeah. <laughs> But he's by far the the winner, the winning taxi driver oh, was, right. was the big D. I think Will Wally talk, uh, told us a little bit about your taxi journeys in, in New York. And in Boston. Oh, in, oh, in Boston. Yeah, yeah, we had a special one in Boston. Yeah. Uh, Together with Will Yeah, Wally? yeah. He, he was a real driver. He was, uh, uh, that was the first, like, it, that was last September last year. So it was sort of like, well, sort of like, the sort of Trump thing was happening but it hadn't happened um, and this taxi driver called it you know he was just like oh, of course he's going to win you know he didn't say it like that he said it in a heavy Boston accent I, I can't actually for the sake of anybody that might listen to this I can't repeat 90% of the things that this taxi driver said to us because he was a, he was a pretty graphic dude um, but yeah that was definitely a He okay. was an, he's, I wouldn't say he was my favorite, but he was up there with the rememberable ones. Mm -hmm. um, what are your musical and personal influences right now? Uh, Billy Lyre has been having quite a big influence on me. <laughs> he's a Scottish songwriter that uh, lives out here in Berlin actually and works at the Ramones Museum so you might have seen him around okay. you can say hi to him <laughs> Billy's here at the nice table Billy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, you seem to be the only one apart from Billy Beck who does Glastonbury every year um, and yeah, yeah sadly we cannot attend this year because we couldn't get tickets but we know that almost happened to you once as well that you didn't sure. get a ticket and you made a song yeah. out of it and it starts with Glastonbury Festival is changing what what is changing is it a good or a bad thing from your point of view uh, it's it's just a thing it's not good or bad you know everything changes of course it has to it's But you just still the way like of it? the world I love it yeah absolutely you know with How all of my heart like yeah yeah Glastonbury. it's exactly that's the thing when people start criticizing things like Glastonbury they've got to rethink their lives really it's like it's, yeah it's changed or whatever but like of all of the things that need criticism in the world you know like parties aren't it especially mm -hmm. someone that's built around you know enjoyment and entertainment and good and good natures you know with, with good sort of like you know spreading important messages and whatnot anybody who's going to moan about that you know don't invite them around for tea you know it's just like um, yeah it's uh, it's And you, you know, you say I play every year, but I think the only the only reason that that's probably happened is 
I've been every year. You know, I never, I never, from the first one I went when I was 16, I haven't ever missed one. Uh, and that was long before I started, yeah. started playing. Uh, so, I, you know, I'd be, and I would, even if there was like, you can't, you know, I'd, I'd work, I'd, I'd go back to like managing the night tent, the dance tent or whatever that I used to do, but hitting up inflatables in some hippie cafe just to get a ticket in. Right? I'd be there regardless. And, but it really seems to get harder and harder every year to get tickets. It is, but I do also believe where there's a will, there's a way. Because I mean, you know, for the whole, until like 2003, uh, it, everybody broke into Massive It was like, uh, that was the, on, the only way, you know. Some people bought tickets, but I don't know who, you know. He used to have a stamp, you know, like when you go to a club, he used to be, you get a stamp on your hand when you handed your ticket in. So people would just, the people that worked giving the stamps out, just used to, on their l lunch break, they'd just go and stamp you for five pounds and get in. <laughs> it was as simple as that. And everybody knew, there was like half the people there were breaking in. And then it was like, right, okay, the, the, the wall was going up, you know, no more breaking in. Um, and I've since then, I've heard loads of, weird stories about how one I think that there's loads of jobs within the festival if you're willing to work then you can definitely get in under some guise or another um, but also you can still break in <laughs> is the truth uh, once was a plane I think uh, uh, someone flew I think someone parachuted yeah. in once yeah I mean that's a bit too grand isn't it I think <laughs> like the, uh, if you want to sneak into festivals the, the, the best way to do it is to not take anything with you When people arrive at festivals, they've got bags and tents and blah, blah, blah. If, and it, at that bit where everybody's got all their stuff, to have someone with nothing on their person is, uh, it looks like yeah. they, they've been there for yeah. a week. Or that, and, uh, and you can just walk through. If you've not got anything on you, you can just walk in <laughs> on your phone. And uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's definitely ways. I've never, I've, I've heard many stories about how people came down on a whim without a ticket and they got in or someone did this and that and got in. I've never heard the story of the, the guy that went down, couldn't get in and got the train home again. You know, that's mm -hmm. maybe it happened and he wasn't there yeah. to tell the story, but I never heard about it. Yeah. Um, you toured a lot through the States recently. Um, is there anything, uh, or were there any... any Signs of regrets for uh, voting Trump? Um, well, yeah, I mean, re not re I didn't meet anyone that had sort of voted for Trump and then wishing that they hadn't. Um, there was some small signs of, of, you know, of divide. You know, I think people would, uh, obviously at my gigs and the kind, you know, the festivals and, and whatnot that I was playing while I was out there. I, I, I found it hard to find people that had positive things to say about him, which is weird. Because it's like, fair enough, I know that like, this wasn't just in my gigs. Or These were like big festivals and big events and, you know, the taxi drivers and stuff. You know, I spoke to as many people as I could about it. And uh, considering he did win, and obviously the majority of the country want, wants him to be the leader, it's hard to find anyone that will kind of sing his praises or... or stand up for what he believes in actually which is odd you know and I I, I made a point of trying to be I, I did a show in like Win, a place called Winters California which is like a 7,000 people live in this town it's like a really small town winery and uh, conservative I guess and the guy that was book, booking the show he was just he was sort of tactfully said be tactful uh, you know uh, I don't know you know he's like, I don't know what you're intending to do but you know it's a small town and and I did deal with it sort of you know as, as gently as I could and he's I spoke to his dad afterwards who's who once he left he said my dad was a huge fan but also a, a, he really liked the music but he was a, he was a Trump supporter but he was enough to we didn't get stuck into it he just said he bought a CD and said oh, I like your music and was willing to you know not go down that road which I guess was fun Mm -hmm. Quite good as well. Certainly, the, the divide of people isn't going to help anything. I think. Yeah. I think I'd like to. I'd like to meet more Trump supporters, but less. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. Um, the the spanner in the works album sounds a bit different than the other. Yeah. yeah. Albums. 
And in my opinion, the only bean sounding song on that one is 2016. 2016, yeah, yeah. yeah. 2016. Um, yeah, why that change? Uh, well, it was album number eight, and it was just like, right, what are we going to, you know, what am I going to do? It just, it just felt like time to mix was up. I came up with the name of Spanner in the Works for it, and I was, I just said to a friend, I was like, I just want to do something different. And he said, just do an album without guitars. I said, automatically, if you don't have guitars, you've got to find a different way of, of making an album. So I hired him as the producer. He'd never really made an album before, but I was like, <laughs> I'm going to make it with you. Uh, and we made it on his laptop, basically. So, um, yeah, so it was all synthesized sounds and samples. And, uh, you know, it was, the songs were written and sounded like every other fucking song. But we sort of took them in and it was like, worked out a way of kind of creating a different sort of back to it and the only one that uh, I always knew the album was going to start with 2016 and we, we actually let, the thing about with working on computers is something I was very sort of wary of is it's endless the amount of noises yeah. that you can make on computers is completely endless so you can kind of fall down this rabbit hole of sort of like overthinking everything which is just not how I ever do anything so it's like and with 2016 we did do a kind of digital version and we started going down that hole and it was just like ah, we got so lost down it I was just like give me the fucking guitar you know I just I just sung it into a mic and was like right we finished the album and it, and it ended up actually being it worked because it kind of sort of lulled people into oh it's just another Beans and Toast album and then after that it kind of it, it spread out from it and uh so yeah, it was a kind of happy accident. But the, the, the original intention was to do a full album without guitars, but just that song ended up with one. So. All right. The last song, Fast Train, is about moving out of town because it hurts so much to see that everything is going in the wrong way, everything is getting way too expensive. And in the end, you sing that you rather stay in the city and not try to, yeah, and that you try mm. to change it, it and not move away from it. Do you still feel that way about London? Yeah, very much. I, tonight, when I get drunk, I'll be like, I'm moving to Berlin. <laughs> like, wherever I go. Isn't that a song? Wherever I go, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> wherever I go, I'm going to move there. I'm like, London is dead. I fucking move. I love Manchester. It's so great in Manchester. I'm moving to Manchester. Like, I get the house prices. I'm moving to Manchester. And then the next night, I'm moving to Edinburgh. Right, and it's like... Um, Because there is, you know, it is it is frustrating. You know, I, I am at the age where I should be looking at, you know, buying a house or at least having, you know, another room on the house that I'm renting. And, I, you know, I love my flat, but it's small. And, uh, and, and it's, it's in London? Still? It's in London, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the truth is, the truth is in that last verse. I don't, things are, you know, I can't leave because, I, you know, I moved to London when I was 19 years old. My, that is home. So it's like, it's uh, it's frustrating that it's so expensive and it's sort of like changing in the way that it is that, that because, but you know, yeah, I will stay there. I mean, my main worry would be for the 19 year old me. You know, when I moved there, it was fucking easy. It was like, yeah, you know, you just like, get a job, get a flat and you just, you know, just work in a fucking shop. It was, it was simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I now, anybody that comes from Braintree where I come from, they'd never be able to just move to London because they wanted a creative life. Not a chance. Like, so, but what does that mean? Without blowing my own trumpet, from moving there, you know, I ran clubs and we did gigs and it's like, you know, I brought something to the city from the fact that it was cheaper to do it. And it's like, if you don't let anybody in apart from people that can afford fucking, like, ex super expensive flats and they don't, need, they don't have that drive to create anything because, well, they've got loads of money anyway. Like, I don't know what it's, I don't know what's going to come out the end of it. You know, I don't need to, I don't need London to be like a late night party city anymore because I'm, you know, I'm over that. But it should, but I think it should be for the fucking for the young people. And I don't know what what future it spells out. You know, so, so yeah, we'll see. I'll probably end up back in Essex. <laughs> <laughs> and you still want to club in London, don't you? Uh, yeah, the, the Monarch, yeah. which is uh, where we're playing tonight <laughs> in Berlin. Uh, yeah, I do. I do like the the, the bookings and, and promo there with with my mate Dave, who I grew up with. Uh, it's um, yeah, it kind of it, it works. It's one of the few jobs that you can do 
while touring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, it's just like in Berlin, there are a lot of cool clubs closing down because of gentrification and yeah. And yeah, you also have some songs about it. Yeah, yeah, got some. Yeah. Bad, so. <laughs> How hard is it to make to make compromises to stay alive as a club, as a cool place? Uh, well, the place that I, I that that I work at is I ju I'm just the, the booker, so you know someone else someone else manages the bar and, and it's and it's owned by a guy that owns like a whole bunch of pubs around. So we we're okay for that, but going back to what I said before, yeah, you know it's difficult and it's like there's. I also feel that in the last year, a lot of things have been put in place. There's like music venues trust and uh, independent venue week and, and stuff like that, where it's like at least people realise that there is a problem now. You know, we've, we've shutting them down. Fabric got reopened. You know, because everyone was just like, this is fucking stupid. You know, I mean, but. Yeah, it's tough, but it's also, I don't want to be the windjar, you know. There's a lot of industries that are in, that are in trouble at the moment, you know. The, things are changing. And music, it's not like people are going to go, all right, we'll stop listening to music. You know, we won't bother with music anymore. It's never going to fucking go anywhere, is it? It's like, it'll just have to work, work, its, way, work its way through. And it sounds like your first choice of leaving the UK is uh, probably New Orleans. Can you uh, think of any other? But I'm moving to yeah. Berlin! <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get a job at the Ramones Museum. <laughs> okay. Are there sometimes moments when you think you don't want to do this touring anymore? No. No? Good answer, okay then. <laughs> I don't have to ask you for a plan B. I guess no. there is none. No, there's no plan B. <laughs> That's the only way it works. Yeah, it's too okay. late for that. And um, will you follow your habit of releasing a new album in December on your birthday? Yeah, yeah of course. Again? And is there something you can tell us? Oh, this album? Now? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, uh, I'm just sorting out the studio for it. I'm going to put together a little band. I got a fiddle player and an accordion player, and. Um, yeah, I've, it's mostly written, you know, there's a song about saving trees, a song about the future. Um, yeah. I'm, so it will be a band album? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it wasn't like that laptop thing was just the one, I'm not going to just keep on making music on laptops, okay. yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at, uh, as ideally, I'm, as soon as I get back I'm going to see the studio, but in a perfect world I'll be recording at Toe Rag Studios, uh, which is, uh, it's like an old tape to tape vintage studio where they did like the early white stripes records and stuff but it's I found out only recently that it's a it's about a minute walk from my house oh <laughs> yeah I was like what so I'd heard the name and it was like this I walk past it every day it's just like behind a suburban house so I'm trying to sort it out so that I can literally just go home for dinner and like be incredible if it works out but yeah fingers crossed it'll be recording it and um, on every record you sing one or more love songs, which are more or less quite openly dedicated to your wife Lizzie B. Mm -hmm. Does she like it or does she still like it uh, to be in your songs? I don't know. Yeah, of course she does. Yeah? yeah. Cool. And yeah. she's in your videos as well. Yeah, yeah, we make the videos together. Yeah. Very beautiful. Oh, thanks. Next time you should bring her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, she wants to come. We do, we generally tour a lot together, um, but we've just done a month in the States and, you know, she's got life to be getting on with, so I did this one by myself. Yeah, and um, apart from Glasgow, you are playing all the, no, all the festivals. All the, all the festivals. The yeah, yeah, all the festivals. Um, Is there any plan to play a German festival? In the future? The, the, my general rule of, of gigs is, you know, I, I only go places that I'm asked, you know. I learned that pretty early on. I started trying to, like, put myself in places and then there was no one there and it was pointless. So it's like, I'd love to, you know, especially after, you know, what I feel is going to be a, a, a great trip out. Yeah, I, you know, but I'm not going to go knocking on their door, no. if you know what I mean. I think it, it, it just works easier the, the other way around. Okay. Okay.
Oh, well, Thank well, I didn't feel like we were sat at the end of, end of a restaurant at all. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah, you thank very you. much. We're looking forward to the... And thanks to Billy Liar for moral thank support. <laughs> <laughs> Visit him yeah. in the Ramones Museum. <laughs> <laughs>